intensity. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, uh, no problem. Um, so we're used to hearing that word diversity um, in terms of uh, demographics, how many folks that we have entering a such and so major at the university. But I want to start by thinking about it in a deeper way as a kind of uh, systems principle. So, so why is it that diversity is so darn useful? You know, you think about your gut health and you need a diversity of microorganisms. You think about how bad white flour and white sugar are. That's because you're not getting the diversity of the plant components, right? The, the, the hull and the pericarp and all those pieces. You think about biodiverse diets being more healthy. You think about ecosystems that are uh, highly resilient and productive and carbon absorbent. Those are the ones that are highest in biodiversity. You think about social systems and certainly uh, our uh, efforts in anti-racism and so on um, have everything to do with the diversity of human resources. You can even improve your finances by diversifying your portfolio, right? So what's up with diversity? Why is it so darn useful? And what do we mean by that term? Well, in many cases, diversity is a kind of slice through time of what is a branching evolutionary form. And so if you think about our, our species in those ways, um, we are not quote unquote more evolved than uh, 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 crabs and earthworms and pigeons and and so on. They've been evolving for just as long as we have. If you think about that uh, 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 equal temporal slice through the, the branching tree of diversity. And this is why the other model, the latter model, is so crucial for white supremacists. They had to have that sense of hierarchy, right? So they had to say, yeah, the earthworm is very, very far down on the tree. And, and, you know, if there is even a tree, right, they're thinking of it as this unilineal straight line. Um, so that's fundamental to, to racism. And that's why um, uh, Charles Darwin, who came out of three generations of hardcore abolitionist activists, was so invested in the idea of evolution. He thought about it first as an abolitionist principle um, before he ported it over to biological evolution of all species. So that bushy shape is due to um, a kind of uh, characteristic time constant for these many different processes. So we have genetic changes that are happening over hundreds of thousands of years, uh, if not millions, for a really significant genetic change. But we have epigenetic change that can happen uh, uh, over a, a, a decade. And then you know, you've got three generations or so uh, that are going to be impacted by that methylation or whatever it is. And then you've got something like behavioral change that you, you can do in, in a, a few years or, or overnight, right? So we have these different time constants going on for these different processes. Um, and that's what's really supporting this ability to uh, adapt uh, and, and to therefore create this bushy, uh, diverse form. So for human beings, um, this starts out maybe 3 million years ago with a, a ex extraordinarily large uh, brain weight to body weight ratio. Um, and then about 250,000 years ago, uh, you've got the contemporary uh, uh, race of uh, modern humans first appearing in Africa. But it's only about 60,000 years ago that humans leave Africa um, and disperse across the rest of the globe. And if you think about the fact that, that it's probably about 20,000 years um, that uh, humans first arrive in the Americas, that's a tiny, tiny amount of time for a species to go from one small place to being cosmopolitan, to spreading all over the earth. That is far too fast um, for some of these loops, right? It's the, it's the right speed for something like behavioral adaptation. So we don't have to evolve fur we can kill somebody else and we're there for, right? We're geniuses. And that has consequences for our genetic makeup. So our um, population bottleneck being a small size at one point um, and then rapid expansion all over the globe means that we're practically clones of each other. Um, and this is a little news item I saw a while back. Uh, they, they had done a genetic investigation of 55 chimpanzees they found more genetic diversity in that 55, group of 55 
than all 6 billion humans on the planet. So it, we have an amazing degree of genetic similarity. But if we're so darn genetically similar, why do we seem so physiologically different? And part of that is the, the glasses that colonialism has had us wearing um, for the last few centuries. So if you look at where this, this concept of races um, first starts really picking up steam and getting applied everywhere, um, it's exactly at that moment when Europeans start traveling everywhere. It's exactly at the moment of colonialism that suddenly scientists are, are discovering that there are these different races of, of humans. But it also has something to do with biology. Now, some biological features are stabilized by the evolutionary process. If you're a, a, a histone molecule, you had better not step out of line. You'd better not start mutating because DNA isn't going to be able to wrap itself around you properly. And then you're not going to get reproduced in the next generation. So evolution keeps a tight leash on histone. There is very little mutation that's successful um, in the case of the histone molecule. But there are other biological characteristics that are at the other end of the spectrum. So if you think about something like height, in essence, just as evolution is, is deliberately, and of course evolution isn't conscious, it doesn't know what it's doing, but deliberately in the sense that there's a mechanism in place for this, evolution is deliberately limiting the amount of mutation that histone molecules can do. It is deliberately freeing up the ability to change height over time because evolution has learned, uh, if, if a, a systems process can learn, uh, that it's successful when it leaves that loose, when it leaves that ability to have you know, a, a, a famine or a drought or something of that sort, and you start to get a few generations that are shorter, right? And at first that's just done with epigenetics, but over time that can be then burned in, so to speak, um, with genetic mutation. And, and folks have been noticing this about the Dutch. So at one point, the Dutch were the tallest people on earth. Um, and uh, lately that's been, they've been shrinking, they've been getting smaller. So you see this fantastic uh, plasticity in our height. And of course, when you ask somebody about races, they'll say something like, well, I know there must be different human races because those Kenyans keep winning the Olympic trials. Right, they're so tall with those long legs. Well, yes, but that's the part that evolution has deliberately been keeping uh, a, a loose, labile, plastic. Uh, so we're, we're uh, incorrectly paying attention to the things that are trivial parts of evolutionary change and not paying enough attention to the parts that are stabilized. And of course, the human brain is one of those stabilized elements uh, in evolution. One of the other labile elements is our immune response. So if you're in an area with a lot of malaria, um, sickle cell anemia is actually not so bad because it's gonna keep you alive um, if you're, you're uh, uh, haploid um, for the, the sickle cell trait. Um, and you can see you know, the problem here is that viruses uh, evolve really, really fast. Um, so I would not be surprised if folks start saying, oh, we found out that there's you know, this correlation with your racial identity um, and your immune response to COVID. Um, but that doesn't mean that there, there are races in this deep biological sense. Uh, it, that's exactly as evolution intended it to be, that you have certain uh, uh, relatively trivial, fast-changing parts of your physiology, just if you have deep parts like the brain that are universal to all humans. All right, so that was part one of my two-part talk. Um, that was understanding evolution um, uh, in biological terms, but now I wanna switch over to thinking about cultural evolution. And you'll see that white supremacists, just as they had that stacking, that ladder shape for biological-based white supremacy, they have the same ladder in place for uh, cultural evolution, for differences in, in, in societies. And they were thinking of these as you know, primitives and savages and barbarians and, and, and on up. So just as, as we need to change our, our, uh, our, our lenses 
from that colonial gaze in the case of biological evolution, we need to do the same in the case of cultural evolution. So you might think about the branching of these forms, this bushy evolutionary tree as these different sorts of knowledge systems. And obviously this is an oversimplification. There's lots of interaction, just as you have that in biological systems as well, right? Um, but it is worth thinking about why European knowledge systems took a right turn. Why, <laughs> why is it that they went off in a particular direction? Um, and, and as in the other cases, it's about feedback loops. So if you look at how the extractive economy and extractive STEM have co-evolved, you will have the core reason for why we've set up our science and technology systems the way we have. You've got skilled employees, even back when Adam Smith was writing Wealth of Nations in 1776, skilled employees demanding more pay because they're skilled. You can't replace them. They can go out on strike. And so Adam Smith says, you know, we really need to do it like the pin factory where you break down the task so that each person is doing something so utterly trivial and routine, you could just grab a bum off the street and hire them to do it. Now <clears throat> you can't have a labor union, nobody can go on strike. But that breaking down of tasks requires a kind of technological support. And so you have science and technology coming in and doing the same kind of uh, reduction and, and extractive based technologies. Vice versa, when a physicist says, oh, I've defined a, an efficient machine um, so that I can measure these physical processes, you have folks on the business side saying, efficiency, that's what I'm talking about. How do I minimize the amount that I have to pay my workers? Because the greater amount of work you get um, will be the, the uh, per pay uh, will be the most efficient factory. So at the end of the day, you have somebody saying, hey, you know, I'm just following physics, right? I'm just making things more efficient. It's a law of the universe. We, we can't have a different kind of science technology. We can't arrange things differently. And if you look at that extractive process, that's behind um, nearly every one of our crises. So extracting ecological value, extracting labor value, or colonizing our eyeballs, colonizing us with something like Facebook, right? Taking over our social networks in the same ways that Europeans took over lands uh, a, a century ago. But we don't have to do science and technology that way. We don't have to arrange economies in that form. Africans were using these generative bottom-up forms rather than a kind of top-down imposition of, of order um, for centuries before Europeans invented the term fractal. Um, and I would love to be able to say that, you know, I looked at this and instantly knew, but of course I didn't. I looked at it and I said, oh, that must be like termite mounds, right? There must be some kind of unconscious bottom-up activity that's creating these self-similar structures. And, and it wasn't until I, I really got into the research and I actually went to Africa and did interviews that I, st I started realizing that these are not unintentional or unconscious. They're quite deliberate. And local folks actually had algorithms for describing that process. So here, for example, you see a Nankani home and you can see these big circular forms and then smaller circular forms. And you get down into the Dago, the woman's room, and she's got these stacks of calabashes and pots. And when she dies, they have a ceremony where they break, the, break that stack. And the smallest container, the compio, is where she keeps her soul. And so uh, when she dies, her soul is released and it goes off to eternity. And they believe in reincarnation. So when a child is born, the soul comes back. In the first iteration of the recursion, the child can't leave this room, it's a baby. In the next iteration, it's a toddler. And so it can go out into this courtyard. And in the next iteration, you're an adolescent and you can go out into the village. And as an adult, you go out into the world. So it's a beautifully symmetric recursive uh, uh, nonlinear scaling system. Um, the first time I, I, I published on this, I sent this off to a journal uh, and the folks there said, oh, Africans can't be using fractals. That's an advanced mathematics concept. So I always love to present this, this particular example. But there's lots and lots of these that you can find, these recursive scaling structures, um, uh, many of which, when I asked folks, they actually had a recipe, they had an algorithm and often a beautiful narrative uh, behind that. 
So we've been using that in, in what we call generative STEM. We've been uh, interviewing folks, in this case, uh, the fractals of cornrow braiding um, right here in Detroit. I'm at the uh, African Bead Museum, as you can see behind me. Um, and uh, then uh, uh, developing software that embeds those algorithms, um, having the kids use those to raise their STEM skills and interests, but then also involving adults who own the braiding shops. And the adults have said, well, you know, we could really use some mannequins that actually look like they were braided in my shop. So we've been using 3D printing for that. Um, there you see a group of, of students using these uh, pH meters to detect uh, hair products. And one of them actually started her own uh, uh, company, her little entrepreneurial venture with a, a, a pH neutral alternative. So it's a, it's a great opportunity to, to bring together um, those heritage algorithms, as we call them, that indigenous knowledge um, with contemporary science and technology. Um, and we've done this in architecture and we've had folks pick it up in uh, sculpture and performance and literature and all sorts of cool stuff. Um, not every indigenous culture does fractals. So they're, they're a, a really vibrant foundation for African thought and design. Um, but working with Native American groups, we found a very different collection of, of these indigenous knowledge systems. This is a, a Hopi story about why the stars look so random in the sky. Um, and they say that uh, a first man, first woman, Adam and Eve in, in, in our language, um, would, would uh, put the, the, the uh, what we call the Big Dipper, uh, it's Dunduryuk in, in one of the native languages. Um, it's supposed to be this sort of fourfold symmetry, right, of the Big Dipper. Um, and then Coyote comes along and just throws mica dust up into the sky. And if you look at the stories of the trickster in, in, in Native American context, it's one damn thing after another. They're just completely random. And of course, it's not just coyote. Raven is a trickster. Crow is a trickster. And in South America, guinea pig is a, is a trickster. But it's always the same. It's always this uh, uh, character who does random things all over the place. And this explains why Native Americans were optimizing for biodiversity. So if you go home and you eat some corn, it's probably that big yellow stock down there because you're from a, a monotheistic culture perhaps. Um, and and if, you're, if you're of European heritage, and so you've been monocropping, right? Uh, if you have a, a God of perfection, you want the one perfect crop that optimizes for the maximum amount of pay. But in the Native American case, what they're doing is they're following the trickster. And they know that trickster will throw a flood one year and a drought the next year, and then a pestilence of bugs, and then a fungus infection. How are you gonna keep up with all the tricks of the trickster? By having an equally tricky and equally diverse set of genetic resources. And so if you look at the exchange between Europe and the new world, um, it was mostly North American plants coming to Europe. So we talk about the wealth of gold, but it was really the wealth of plants. It was things like um, uh, pumpkin and tobacco and quinine, tomato. I don't know what the, Europe, what the Italians were putting on pizza and spaghetti, but it wasn't tomatoes. That's a new world plant. You think about vanilla, chocolate, uh, 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 peanuts, pineapple, blueberry, all these plants that I see in Africa, like cassava, that I think are African plants, they're actually new world plants. They were all bred over, over many, many, many generations by Native Americans following in the path of the trickster, following that impetus to increase uh, biodiversity. Um, and we, we've applied the same kind of, of process working with our, our Native American colleagues. So here you see folks at Northern Michigan uh, university um, working, um, it's the, the uh, uh, NMU Center for Native American Studies that works with the Anishinaabe community. Um, the um, Potawatomi Nation School got involved with this. Uh, they had an elder showing us how to do these wigwam structures, and then we've used that as the basis for uh, uh, various sorts of things with the students in the community. Um, and uh, so that's what we do. And I will stop there and, and ask for questions. Wow, that was a very exciting talk. Um, so Bahar and I have a lot of questions for Dr. Eglish, but before we take over the conversation, I kind of want to open it up to you guys. If you have any questions before we go ahead and get a conversation started. 
Cool. <laughs> so um, you spent some time in Africa studying architecture of African villages and basically discovered that this, this architecture is not random and disorganized, but made up of these fractal patterns. And not only that, but this architecture, you know, they had this architecture before it was discovered essentially by Europeans. So as a third world country, Africa sort of has the impression of being underdeveloped and undereducated. How much of that do you think is like a difference in Western culture versus African culture or even a Western bias of African culture? Um, yes, it's bias. Um, but it can be quite challenging to, to get at what's going on there. So, so um, uh, let, let me, let me uh, uh, I can show you better than I can tell you. Let me show you an example of that. Um, I can get out of here. Uh, let's see here. So this is the, the website we use uh, for um, uh, mostly K through 12 education. These are uh, a dinkra. And so this is a, uh, a traditional stamping uh, 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 practice uh, in Africa. One of my um, favorite colleagues here, uh, Gabriel Boache, who, who unfortunately passed away just a couple of years ago. Um, there's Gabriel. Uh, with his pot of ink. So they carve these stamps um, and they make the ink out of tree bark. Um, let's see, I think you can hear this. Not, yeah, you can hear it. Ink is smaller like this. Okay? So you have to break three bundles of this. Like, you know, this is one bundle. You see? So two, three. To make Full of this one, full of this bag. Now what we did yesterday, this is yesterday. So this one yesterday. Like, you know, we are the rainy season for two days. Like getting to November. So they go through this process of, of uh, gathering the bark, soaking it, and then boiling it down in these huge tubs. Um, and then they, they uh, 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 strain out the remainder and you get this boiled bark. Um, but after they strain it out, the leftover bark goes out to the forest. Um, let's see if I've got my uh, diagram here to really sum this up. Uh, sustainable ink. That's the diagram I was looking for. Um, so, so once once you've harvested your bark, you you boil it. Um, that uh, 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 the initial soaking becomes a medicine. Uh, 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 you boil it down. That becomes ink, and then they strain out the remaining bark, and that goes back into the forest in the uh, um, uh, form of compost. Basically, it can either go into farming compost or, or into the sacred forest where nobody's allowed to take anything. In the sacred forest, you have this explosion of biodiversity. You walk in there and monkeys swinging from trees and everything. Um, and the monkeys and birds are carrying that biodiversity in the form of seeds back to the area where the ink tree grows, the body tree. So the whole thing has this beautiful circular economy to it. Um, and what I've been doing with my engineering students was now trying to, to sort of empower that using uh, solar cooking rather than firewood based cooking. Um, nonetheless, that's the circular economy that Western engineers have been trying to achieve all this time, right? And are, and are just miserably failing to do so. And now they actually have a term for it, circular economy. Um, but I, it, it took me quite a while to see that stuff, right? I would walk into a village and I would say, um, so I, I wanna find out about your geometry. You know, I, I see these beautiful logarithmic spirals. Can you tell me about that? I see these fractal patterns. Tell me all about that. And they would say, well, first, let me take you to the forest and you can see the plant that we carve this from. And I'd kind of roll my eyes and say, yeah, yeah, all right, whatever. 
<laughs> right? And so it took me quite a while to realize, oh my God, that the heritage algorithm is not just the part that I'm simulating on the screen. The heritage algorithm in full is the, the biodiversity. It, it goes out everywhere. And I'm not even used to thinking about algorithms in those terms, right? Because I'm, 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 you know, I was a cybernetics major and then a systems engineer and I worked in the Silicon Valley. It took me quite a while to realize there's another way to think about these algorithms as a kind of relation with the world. Um, so, so yeah, on the other hand, you're right. Um, we can use this to contest that sort of uh, uh, civilized, uncivilized, developed, undeveloped. But it takes quite a while to sort of develop, you know, the eyes and ears to be able to see that stuff. And I'm, I'm certainly still working on it a lot myself. Thank you. Okay, can I just follow this up with a question to go back? Because you just mentioned that you majored in cybernetics and you worked in Silicon Valley. Can you talk about how you sort of went from there to what you're doing now? Uh, sure. Um, so, so. Um, when I got my uh, uh, degree in cybernetics, I had read Norbert Weiner's book, The Human Use of Human Beings. Um, and you know, you, you, uh, you listen to these Nobel Prize winners and somebody says, you know, well, I, I won the Nobel Prize in nuclear physics, but you should only use it for good. Well, it's too late, you know, <laughs> right? So, so, so I wanted, I was in high school and I, I was watching these guys thinking, you know, man, you should have started that, only use it for good 50 years ago. Um, so reading, reading Norbert Weiner was a real eye-opener for me. I thought, wow, here's somebody who wanted to do good from the get-go. And so I majored in cybernetics for that reason. There was no graduate program in cybernetics, but they had a graduate uh, degree, a master's degree in systems engineering that was more or less the same thing. Um, I got to the Silicon Valley and, you know, it's exactly as you would expect it to be. So that was pretty unsatisfying. Um, but I, I, I was frustrated by the fact that when I'm in an engineering class, if I raise my hand and I say, what about the, you know, political economy aspects of this? They say, well, this is a class in differential equations. There's no politics, there's no economy. So I wanted to see what the other side had to say. And, and so I heard about this professor, um, Donna Haraway, that had this cyborg manifesto. Um, so I, I, I uh, became a graduate student in the History of Consciousness program. And uh, Angela Davis um, joined shortly after I did. Um, Huey Newton, had, had, had uh, founder of the Black Panther Party, had graduated from there. Um, so it had this really interesting reputation as being about as far from engineering and the Silicon Valley as you can get in some ways. Um, but I, I was also a little frustrated there because, you know, I, I felt like in engineering, they were tying this hand behind my back. I, I would ask, okay, so we're, we're talking about political economy. Could we use a kind of systems analysis here? And they'd say, well, mathematics, that's the, the tool of white capitalist patriarchy. You know, so now they're tying the other hand behind my back, right? Um, so it was it was quite a, a struggle to find a place where the right half and the left half of my brain could could really come together. Um, and it, it, I, I didn't really feel that I had sort of found that element until um, I applied for the um, Fulbright as a postdoc, so that I could travel around Africa and check out this idea I had about fractals. And that was where I, I finally felt, oh, you know, now it's coming together. So I have a, a sort of- oh, We have a question over there. Oh, yes. yes. Somebody else have a Go ahead. Actually, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more on this idea of um, having to find legitimacy in the European like naming of these terms, like this is fractals or this is a circular economy. Like, are there, are there other systems that don't have sort of a European stamp of approval that it's harder to discuss and get people to take seriously because they haven't because their systems that have it don't have a european equivalent well it's it's all hard to discuss <laughs> <laughs> and it's and it's it's all hard to get folks to take this stuff seriously right um so so I, I i agree i'm kind of grasping at straws when i say well let's just call this um algorithms um, and I know it's not the algorithms you guys are used to, 
but we can call it heritage algorithms or extended algorithms. But I still, I, you know, I, I can't take folks to take this stuff seriously, no matter what. It's, it's so interesting to me that, you know, you hear folks say, um, my data is in the cloud, right? So, so, so what's the cloud? Don't, don't tell me it's a puff of water vapor in the air. That's not where, where Google's putting its data. What's the cloud? Anybody? Gigantic set of servers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're, they're big hunking machines and they're really hot. They, they burn up an incredible amount of energy, all the more so if you're doing blockchain and Bitcoin, right? Um, and they, they need enormous amounts of electricity and they need enormous amounts of water as a coolant. Now, where do you find water as a coolant and electricity, hydroelectric dams? And where uh, in the 1970s and, and 80s and 90s were there a bunch of hydroelectric dams sitting around waiting to be used in the Columbia River Basin? There's, there's only one un unfortunate uh, thing. Native Americans had settled in the Columbia River Basin for exactly the same reason, because there's this wonderful water system that has all the salmon in it. So, you know, when we when we talk about the, the 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 algorithm, we don't think about it as the extended algorithm that reaches down into the ecosystem. But that's why Bitcoin is so expensive, is that it's managed to privatize the commons, right? It's managed to take that invisible part of the algorithm that you're not seeing and lay claim to it in a way that, that then extracts that value over to the wealthy. So, so you know, I, I totally agree. I have trouble articulating what I mean by this algorithm that reaches into the ecosystem, um, but that doesn't mean Europeans aren't using it, right? Taking advantage of it. It just means that they've made it invisible. They've invisibilized it by not naming it. And I, and I find that's, that's often the case that, that folks in, in uh, STEM disciplines are well aware of many of these things, um, but they're either deliberately not naming it because it behooves them to do so, or it's it's just it's not on their their radar screen. Um, so yeah, I, I'm constantly coming across things that uh, that I'm struggling. How do I translate this in a way that's going to get conveyed? Um, I'll I'll give you uh, one other example here. So when we first started doing this. Um, I had no grants, and so I was just doing all this stuff, uh, uh, you know, my spare time. Um, but I saw we we had this really fantastic opportunity um, to uh, have uh, uh, African American students involved with these fractals um, because some of them made it through the Middle Passage, and they made it to the Americas, and and the innovation continued. The invention of these fractal shapes con continued um, in the diaspora community. And of course, that goes back and forth between the US and Africa. So in 1968, if you look at cornrows in Nigeria, they're, they're riffing off of African American cornrows and, and, and vice versa, right? What Paul Gilroy calls, calls the Black Atlantic. So, so I saw this great opportunity. And, and you know, we asked uh, the kids, I was in New York at the time, we asked kids, where do cornrows come from? And they all said, Brooklyn. So we <laughs> realized, you know, we've actually got to include sort of the, the cultural uh, education part of this as well. It, it can't just be uh, um, about doing the math. But once, once we got in, into the mathematics part of it, um, the teachers started complaining and they started saying, well, you're, you're talking about recursion and fractals. That's not part of the K through 12 curriculum. Um, and, and so uh, finally I realized, oh, well, if I talk about it, as uh, transformational geometry, as translation, rotation, and scaling, right? Now I can create this really simple little block space program um, that not only do the kids love, but even the math teachers are willing to do it. Um, and <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be surprised how stubbornly resistant the, the math teachers can be to this sort of thing. Um, but the, the beauty of it is, you know, the kids immediately, uh, they're playful, they're little kids. And so they start playing around with it. And so they're learning these things in this very um, embodied way, right? Um, and, and so they're doing the translation, regardless of, of what screw ups the teacher and I are, are, are having, they're managing to own it and, and possess it and make it their own. And that's really the, uh, the most important part of it. I thought 
have a partial comment, partial question. So first, I was like really happy that you mentioned your personal story about how you tried to publish about the fractals. I don't know how happy is right word, but about the fractals and how they were like kind of like, well, no, there's no way that this was a thing happening in African society. Uh, or the example where you said Native Americans have been doing like you no know, genetic crosses before you even thought about it, I guess. I don't know. But <laughs> um I, I always had a hard time uh, with the fact that people, I guess with the European mindset often like discredit like these uh, people, other people's uh, technologies. Like for example, I think people have heard about how there's claims of like, you know, the pyramids are made by aliens. So there's no way that the Egyptians had this technology. So we have to come up with some like otherworldly explanation for it. You know, stuff like that I've always found frustrating. Uh, but my question is, um, I want to know how the story ended when you try to publish uh, your information. <laughs> <laughs> you said that they kind of like looked at it funny and they weren't happy with it. So I was wondering what happened and how did the conversation go and how often does that happen to you? So, so that, that was the um, Journal of African Studies, um, which is published by the African Studies Association. Um, and they, they contacted me uh, a, a couple of years ago, and, and they said, um, it's, it's the, uh, the uh, 20th anniversary of the publication of the African Fractals book. We'd like to have a special panel um, at the African Studies Association. And I said, oh, now you want to have a special panel. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, you know, I, I, I gave up. I just decided, man, those, those guys just don't want to talk to me. Um, that's eventually maybe they'll come around and, and maybe they're right. Maybe what I'm saying is a stupid idea. Okay. Um, I have a question about the Fractals book. Um, so you mentioned before how you know, our understanding of Statistics and randomness uh, is based on you know, different belief systems of different communities. Um, and I read uh, some of your work about the IFA divination for the Yoruba people um, and how they use a base two system. Um, but I was wondering, and I believe they also follow fractal community patterns, but I was wondering if you um, had any thoughts on perhaps the other direction, whether um, the understanding of statistics, randomness, and community structure uh, with fractals ever affected different communities, uh, you know, religious or belief systems um, in, in the other direction, or if, you know, the, uh, I guess the evolution of their community structures um, and mathematical understanding uh, also paired with um, evolution in their beliefs. The, the short answer is yes. Um, I, 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 I will often tell my students, um, if we're, we're sitting in a room with a window, um, to look outside the, the window at a tree, if there's a tree handy, um, and ask themselves where the Department of Hydrology is. How does the tree know how to draw water up from its roots into the stem if there's no Department of Hydrology, right? Um, where's, where's the Department of, of Protein Synthesis? Where, you know, <laughs> how is the tree managing to do all this stuff? And the answer is, well, the tree doesn't need that stuff, right? Um, and, and that's certainly my view of, of these disciplines, whether it's, you know, math over here and theology over here, that we've, we've sort of artificially divvied those up. Um, so yeah, I, I, would, I would, not only would I say there's interaction between something like the mathematical system and the religious system, um, but even calling it an interaction sort of assumes a separateness that's not necessarily there. Let, let me give you a very specific example. Um, so I mentioned that in the Native American case, um, the trickster is random. And if you look at um, uh, some of the Native American cultural practices, a lot of them formed around gambling, which is why we have casinos on Native American lands today. Gambling was just a huge, deep cultural enterprise, not, not for uh, like, a, like a payoff, um, but, but generally um, for health. So you would have a ritual in, in which gambling would take place because somebody's sick or uh, you know the well is dried up or or, or whatever. Um, so so you have this relationship between um, throwing dice as a divination system in Native American culture, uh, gambling, uh, the religion of the trickster, and this agriculture that's based on biodiversity and maximizing 
uh, the, the complexity of genetic resources, right? That's on the Native American side. On the African side, if you looked at those same categories, you would see something very different. So Africa also has tricksters. For example, uh, Anansi the spider uh, is one of the famous tricksters in Africa. Um, uh, some, you know, sometimes it's the spider, sometimes it's a, a rabbit. Um, if you listen to the Br'er Rabbit stories from the, the American South, um, a lot of those are reflecting those African trickster stories. And as you know, Br'er Rabbit does his tricks not by acting unpredictably as it would in the Native American case, but by folding the story back on itself. So, so, so how, do you, how do you get the, the, uh, the, the, the enemy to throw you into the briar patch so that you can escape? You say, please, whatever you do, don't throw me into the briar patch, right? <laughs> Um, there's a famous Nigerian story called um, Who's Talking? Guy goes into the forest and he looks down at the forest floor and there's a skull there. And he says, ha, huh, I wonder how this skull got there. And the skull turns around and says, talking brought me here. And he says, oh my God, a talking skull. And he runs back to the village and tells everybody and he brings them out and they come out and he says, okay, skull, do your stuff. And the skull does nothing, it just sits there. And the chief says, this man has formed a diversion so that his colleagues can steal from our field. We've got to go back there, but before we do, off with his head. So they chop off his head, everybody leaves, and the skull slowly turns to the decapitated head and says, how did you get here? And the decapitated head says, talking, talking brought me here, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so the trickster stories in Africa are not random, they're not stochastic, right? They're, they're recursion, they're, they're, they're uh, producing that diversity through a deterministic feedback loop. Go ahead. So like something that I've noticed through the different like stories that you've told us and things that you've pointed out is that like there seems to be this um, like inherent awareness of physics and like energy science uh, in these cultures. Like for example, the, the, you know, Acknowledging the existence of the trickster implies an understanding of entropy in systems. And like the, the thing about the um, computer servers utilizing energy and resources from the Columbia River Basin, which is also why people settled there, because they're also utilizing the energy in that system through the, you know, the pairing of water and sediments and fish and those sorts of things. So they're pretty much equivalent. But I'm wondering, like, what is the difference here that makes one use of resources sustainable and one not, where the Western system is unsustainable, but the, the Native American system is? Like, what's the difference? Um, so the, so the, the, the difference is a difference in extraction, right? So, so it's, it's your ability to pull value out of a system without having to return that value to it. Um, and so, so in the case of, of something like um, organic agriculture, um, you can see pretty easily how that works, right? So you, you, you've, you've got your leftover plant material and you ate your apple and threw away the core. If you take all of that, you put it back into the soil and that regenerates the soil thanks to the bacteria and so on that live there. So the whole thing is in a loop. If you look at the decline in soil quality, in, in factory farms, these massive million acre farms, it's because they're pulling that value out of the soil and not returning it. Now you can try to return it in a, a kind of a, a attenuated form, but once you've performed that extraction, that, that's the end of the story, right? No amount of, of pesticides and artificial fertilizers and such is really gonna bring back the vibrancy of that, uh, that uh, uh, natural ecosystem that used to be in the soil that was munching up all of your compost and turning it into fertilizer. The same thing happens in labor systems. So if I'm in a, a traditional system, uh, I'm making moccasins, you're growing corn. I say, yeah, I, I know how long it takes you to grow that much corn. You know how long it takes me to, to hunt the deer and skin the skin and, and make the moccasin. You know, here's a fair trade. Now, if, if you're uh, at University of Michigan and you work as a staff person and after work, you go to the parking lot and you see your boss 
stuff 10,000 ears of corn into the trunk of their car, you might think, well, this isn't fair, right? <laughs> and that would, that, would be, that would be true, but you'll never see that because capitalism has figured out how to compress value. After it extracts it, it, it invisibilizes it, it congeals it into something called money. And this is the, the function that money forms is, is to disguise social relations so that you don't see them. Um, and that's why Bitcoin is so great at disguising the kind of ecological destruction that it's carrying out. So when you look at something that's um, beadwork, you know, I've got some, some traditional beadwork behind me here. You see, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these teeny tiny beads. And you go, oh my God, that must have taken all day. Or you look at traditional cornrows and you see these teeny tiny braids and there's like hundreds of these things. And you go, oh my God, that must have taken all day. Well, that's the point. Look at, look at how long my friend spent on my hair. Can't you see the labor value, right? You're making, trying to make labor value as visible as possible through these intricate fractal designs, whereas capitalism is making it as invisible as possible. That's the, the distinction. So we just, we just received a National Science Foundation grant from the uh, Future of Work program um, to see if we could use digital technologies to facilitate these kinds of unalienated labor forms. So we're working with um, artisans in Detroit. It's the reason I'm at the African Bead Museum right now. Um, and we're looking at how things like uh, laser cutters and 3D printers and, and uh, uh, digital metrics for uh, growing things in the soil, um, how that can be used to sort of nurture unalienated forms of labor uh, in ecological exchange, rather than the, the sort of Marxist vision of, well, let's just extract it all and have the state redistribute stuff. Um, I, I'm very skeptical that any state is ever gonna act like Santa Claus and, and just redistribute value. Somehow, somehow that never seems to work out. I'd much rather see um, uh, the unalienated form of production of generativity um, empowered at the grassroots without ever having to, to leave and go elsewhere. I have a, a follow-up question then. Is it possible for um, populations that live in a sustainable like circular economy system to grow and expand uh, and support continually larger populations given the, the limited resources that we have on the planet or in our geographic area? Or is that like a, a is that way of life like naturally limiting the size or you know wealthiness of a population? I've 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 learned over the years that when you get a question like that, the best response is, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, so I will, I will say this. Um, if you read the anthology titled Agnotology, which is about the production of ignorance, there's a wonderful chapter in there about indigenous forms of birth control and how part of colonialism was creating ignorance of those forms, taking that away from, from people. Um, so, so uh, I, I would I would think that if somebody's interested um, in decolonizing uh, population control, that might be a good starting point. It's just doing the research to find out how we're folks pull, managing to pull off uh, uh, the, the the sustainable populations over time. I just have one question. So on the um, slides just now, um, when I like the slide about the corn diversity that you had. And then I think in a few of your slides, you mentioned about how religious beliefs um, kind of help um, with the progression of the African cultures. So I just have a question. From your experience, um, when people, you know, um, um, kind of progress with technology, is religious belief um, something that can go along with it? Or do you think it's limiting? Or do you think it um, can cooperate with the progression of the technology? I, I'm an optimist. I, I think the glass is always half full. So, so if you give me half a glass of religion, I'll look for, a, I'll look for a, a, a good place where I can connect that to these, these unalienated generative forms. Um, 
you know, I, I, ma I made that little quip about monocropping in agriculture and monotheism in the religion. Um, but uh, if you look at Christian traditions, uh, you can see some really spectacular examples of this stuff. You look at, for example, what the Quakers were doing, you know, around abolition 200 years ago. Um, if you look at uh, restorative justice in uh, African traditions, Native American traditions, all indigenous societies uh, uh, typically have some form of, of not the kind of vengeful punitive justice that our criminal system uses, but restorative justice, right? You'll also see that uh, in religions like the like the Quakers. Um, so yeah, I I I I think any any uh, spiritual system has the potential uh, to contribute. I think we have. Oh, yes, go ahead. Sorry, I won't do it if there's somebody else that runs. No, go ahead. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I know that we can think about uh, cultures evolving from a point of origin the same way that we can think about species or genes. Um, so, you know, the, all these different systems of organizing information and cultures originally came from one, you know, one individual, like single culture of humans. And so I'm wondering, like, do you have any theory as to why you know, the European view of things is different from the Native American view of things, it's different from the African view of things. And what about like our geographical spread and like population history has led to us adopting one way of thinking versus another? So, so uh, uh, Jared Diamond is, is famous for, for proposing this. He, he said, uh, if you're in this uh, uh, European temperate climate, you can manage to amass a great store of something like wheat. And once you have that great store of wheat, now you have the power to, you know, determine who, who gets to eat. Um, and so, so Diamond said it's, it's all about the fact that in the tropics, food rots really quickly and you, you, you just can't amass uh, uh, the kind of food wealth that you can in temperate climates. Um, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure that's, that's really true. So, so if you look at um, African traditions around something like hunting, for example, um, the, the uh, uh, folks in the Kalahari Desert, Hung would, would be the way they pronounce their name, um, they, they uh, have a system called Hakaro um, in which the person who made the arrow owns the meat that was killed by the arrow. So um, if you're uh, disabled, you're unable to walk, or you're, you're just uh, too old to go out on, on a hunting trip um, or you know, by, by whatever uh, identity you have um, that's not available, you can still make arrows. And if your arrow brings down game, that is your kill. Um, they have a system called insulting the meat. So if there's a really, really beefy prize piece of meat that comes along, nobody says, oh my God, that's great. They all say, what? You expect me to eat that stringy little piece of meat, right? So they've built up over time, all of these leveling mechanisms, all of the, the, these uh, uh, systems by which you can make sure that nobody is amassing power and, and accumulating uh, uh, a wealth. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that it makes sense to me to say that it's, it's just about uh, 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 climate. Um, I, to me, it makes more sense to say that, that this is like uh, chaos theory, it's sensitivity to initial conditions. You know, once you get started on a particular feedback loop, that just reinforces itself. Once you get started on the road uh, to extraction, you produce technologies and knowledge systems that are about extraction, and that uh, further, you know, digs your grave, that, that sets you along that path further and further. Um, and you see that in biological evolution all the time, you know, dolphins and whales did not evolve gills, right? Once once you're on the path to have lungs, you're 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 kind of stuck there. I, I'm I'm afraid I've got to go. I've run out of time. <laughs> Thank well, you so much. Yes, this was a fascinating discussion. Thank you for taking the time to talk with all of us. Ha happy to have folks email me if you want to discuss anything further. It was great okay. talking to folks. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.